Hello, everybody. Welcome to today's African Composers interview. We have a guest composer today, a South African composer joining us. Before we start the interview, or before we go into the questions, I would like to thank anybody who will watch this interview live, who will join us live. Thank you for your support, your interest. Feel free to leave comments and to ask questions. Pose your questions in the comments section and I will uh, present them to the guests for today, depending on the questions. <laughs> um, and anybody who will watch this later as a recorded interview, thank you also for your interest. Welcome once again to another African Composers interview. So to our guest composer of today, thank you very much for joining us. How are you doing today? Thank you so much. You're fine. And thank you for inviting for inviting me. You're very welcome. So um, I would like to ask you to uh, start the interview by introducing yourself, please. Thank you. And and I should actually start by saying thank you for this wonderful initiative. Uh, I think it's an important one uh, to uh, allow um, our African composers to present themselves, but also to actually uh, expose themselves to to the world. So I was born in uh, uh, a small uh, township called Umlazi, uh, south of Durban. Uh, Durban is uh, uh, east coast uh, of South Africa. Uh, and I was born in a rather big family, and I grew up with mainly with my grandmother. Uh, the reason I'm saying this is because it strongly influenced me uh, to later understand how and why I started uh, to uh, be interested in being a composer. Um, as many of us will relate to the story that uh, uh, African families, particularly when you grow up in a big family, um, there is always a, a, a challenge in as a kid to uh, make your voice heard, but also to uh, have an opportunity to be understood and uh, to be um, uh, to to respond. So you you grow up to learn a culture of silence, and uh, for a while this was okay with me, but. As I started university, I realized it's one of the uh, biggest uh, issues uh, that affected uh, also my personal life. And uh, I began to think of composition and understand composition as a way of uh, expressing myself and allowing my voice to be heard, you know. And I started music when I was around 12, um, pretty much by chance, actually. Uh, there was a, a famous uh, jazz musician called Dr. Brian Tuss, who was my neighbor and a family friend. And uh, one day when I was busy playing soccer, uh, pretty bad at it, um, uh, he, he thought maybe actually I could be a better musician than I was a, a, a soccer player. Uh, so he started to teach me how to play trumpet. And uh, uh, funny enough, I had, uh, when, I, when I started and I was in music, I had always dreams of playing the double bass, uh, which unfortunately he didn't have. So we could play the instrument that he has, whether, uh, which is either the trombone or the trumpet. <laughs> so I, uh, by default, end up playing uh, the trumpet, and then uh, I went to the church band, which is the Salvation Army, stayed there for many years and became a huge part of who I am and, uh, and natured my musical ability as well uh, before I went to the university. And I played, of course, uh, uh, in a number of youth bands and so on. But uh, I'm saying this because uh, Dr. Brian Tutsi was a crucial uh, part of uh, uh, building who I am. And he was the first opportunity to write first examples of uh, uh, composition. Uh, which we experimented with the church band and so on. And it's, it's, that's where my interest really started to be able to uh, 
take something from a theoretical sort of perspective where we uh, doing theoretical examples and exercises and to uh, seeing and hearing this thing uh, coming alive uh, being performed by by the band was was very exciting it felt to me was um, as if my voice is coming out and so <clears throat> As I went to the university, I also realized that the tools, the kind of tools that I, I had at that point uh, were somehow not enough to express really what I wanted to. So it kind of like uh, gave me a, a space, but it was a limited kind of space of expressing myself. Um, so the uh, other part of me was that I, uh, uh, liked drawing and uh, uh, perhaps uh, before I'm a musician I'm more of a, an artist uh, and I in high school I studying how to draw and paint um, so that's always the visuals were always part of me and the uh, uh, kind of the tonal structure uh, uh, of music sort of limited me um, so when I was introduced uh, to 12 tone, uh, which is funny, you know, but it, it somehow uh, uh, liberated me out of this uh, sort of uh, contained space of uh, tonal music, you know. And I started experimenting, but my main purpose was to actually find new sounds and new colors that were not necessarily the... Um, the most obvious ones that you associate with uh, uh, tonal music, but also just the uh, uh, instrument uh, in general, you know. Um, soon I find out that also the 12 tone system itself was uh, a bit limiting, limiting uh, in terms of the colors that I was looking for. Uh, it was a, a liberating in terms of dealing with pitch, but it was not necessarily uh, satisfying in me achieving the kind of uh, uh, um, sound space that I was looking for. So later on, when I moved to uh, Stuttgart, um, I uh, studied with uh, a composer, Italian composer uh, called Marco Stroppa, uh, who introduced me to uh, uh, spectralism. Uh, and and this I found to be very close to what I actually uh, was interested in. and uh, But it also spoke to my roots too, uh, because before I left South Africa, I was studying uh, traditional music, traditional bow music from the Khausa people, as well as the Zulu people. Uh, and, and majority of that structure of that music is based on overtone singing. So this really fitted well with the uh, idea of spectralism. And uh, I started developing this, this idea of sound as the foundation of uh, uh, how to compose, as opposed to just pitch, you know. And I went to... Uh, America after my master's studies in Stuttgart uh, to do my PhD at Columbia University, where I worked with um, the famous uh, jazz musician uh, who uh, has become my mentor, uh, George Lewis. Uh, and uh, he not only opened my eyes and ears and thinking, uh, about music, but actually he gave me new tools on how to approach a composition, but not only just composition in a vacuum, but how to approach composition as a voice within a society. So uh, in short, in a nutshell, uh, that's, that is where I am right now, where I start to combine uh, um, the, my idea for my voice, individual voice, but also understanding that I live within society and so to uh, the, the society, but also how does it speak to social issues related to uh, current uh, problems that we're facing 
uh, in South Africa, but also across the continent too. Um, so I work with a number of composers across the, the, the continent who have been um, very helpful in, uh, again, developing who I am, but also developing what I do. I've worked with people like Ezra Abate in uh, um, Ethiopia. I've worked with uh, a little bit, uh, uh, had a meeting with uh, uh, um, Justinian in Uganda, and I look forward to working with more with other uh, composers across the continent as well. Uh, I mean, there are younger uh, composers uh, uh, who are good friends of mine, and it's always wonderful and enlightening to exchange ideas uh, with them. So that's uh, in a nutshell uh, who I am and where I where I am, and I hope that actually also it explains uh, in in a very limited way the direction that I hope to take in in the future. Fantastic. Thank you very much for that introduction. We've had quite an interesting um, life so far as a composer. Thank you very much for that insight. Um, before we carry on talking about music, I think I just want to quickly ask this very quick question about your art. You say you like to draw. So just very quickly, do you still draw and how is that going? I I don't find as much time as I would love to, uh, to draw. Uh, I find pleasure Just give us a second. I think we've lost our composer. And I find pleasure in... Hello. Sorry. Sorry. I yes. think we lost you for a few seconds. If you don't mind starting again, sorry. I was just saying that I don't find uh, enough time to draw myself, but I find pleasure in uh, uh, giving advice to my daughter who has taken up drawing and uh, spend a lot of hours uh, drawing and uh, we talk through her drawings and uh, how to improve them, but also uh, from the uh, meaning side of it. And so th that's always exciting. Okay. All right. So let's talk about um, this this uh, sentence. You you said Africa and the culture of silence. I'm not so sure if that is um, something that all Africans will recognize. I'm trying to dig deep into my own, you know, younger years and wondering if I can identify any culture of silence or any time when I had to be silent. But you talked about composition, it's almost like giving you a way to speak. Do you want to give us one or two examples of how this culture of silence manifested itself in your own experience growing up? What is the culture of silence? So, um, the uh, in my culture, uh, as a kid, for example, you cannot uh, really speak about whatever troubles you uh, with an adult, uh, unless it, it's something uh, really serious. And uh, uh, but something personal, uh, you you kind of like forced to bottle up, you know. And um, even something painful uh, uh, that troubles you, uh, it's something that is not encouraged, but particularly not encouraged when you are a boy, you know, you are forced and uh, pushed to, to think of uh, men as this strong uh, creature that actually, um, uh, does not feel pain, does not cry. And of course, I mean, like, as you grow up as a black man, you uh, observe also how the society sort of treats you. Uh, you're constantly a threat. Uh, you are constantly uh, uh, this uh, monster uh, which cannot sort of... Uh, have any other feelings other than to be strong and uh, have everything under control, so to say. I don't know if I am expressing myself well, but of course, I think, uh, Black Lives Matter really speaks to this culture of how 
um, men are observed uh, and perceived uh, in a set, not just men, but black men in particular. And, and that's uh, uh, coming also from this culture of silence within my, my own culture. Uh, I think actually also you're absolutely right uh, that one has to be uh, uh, careful on speaking in general uh, in terms of Africa because there is uh, uh, different cultures and different uh, traditions across the continent, but also uh, one has to uh, acknowledge that there are families uh, which were really amazing that liberated their own kids to be able to express themselves. So um, that's in my culture for when I grew up was not the, was not of, often the case. Uh, it doesn't mean that uh, there were not exceptions to this. Okay, I mean, thanks for pointing that out. I didn't mean to point that out. I just wanted to find out more about this culture of silence. Um, yeah, and it's, yeah. uh, it's really interesting. We're talking about music today, so I don't want to go into um, South Africa and perhaps you, you talked about being a black man. Um, and then yeah. expectations on you as a black man specifically. And I'm, I was wondering, uh, could that be because of your country and the, the different, well, very, very marked different racial groups that are in your country and the, re the recent history about apartheid and that, you know, that story, that background. But then you mentioned that fact that you spent time in Stuttgart as well. So I'm not really sure. Um, it's really, you know, it's your experience, but it's a pity that we want to concentrate on the music today, but you know, good that you, you speak to us through your music and of course you speak to us, you know, um, the way you want, as freely as you want now. So that's brilliant. Um, also a pity again, I guess also not being a man, maybe this is something that I cannot <laughs> talk much about because I do, I, I, I remember just growing up and saying whatever I like, but again, I, I guess if this was a man speaking to you, the person might be able to say, oh yes, it's true as a man, you can't really express this. People will laugh at you if you cry, or if you say certain things, but okay, I acknowledge that. And good that we can hear you speak freely and I'm sure you are encouraging future generations to say what they think whenever they think. But if we just move on um, quickly to the fact that you started quite early, at the age of 12 already. And around that time, you started to experiment with music, but then you went on to compose, uh, to study composition, sorry. And you talked about the fact that you were looking for tools or you were finding new tools. Otherwise I would have thought, if you already started composing as a child, going on to study composition, I mean, would you, did you think to yourself, well, I already composed, what's the point of studying? So I, I, let me uh, just correct. I started music quite late and started playing trumpet at 12. So, uh, and that's, uh, I think around 17, 16, 17, that was when I started to experiment with composition. And of course, I mean, at that point, it was not necessarily really composition. It was almost an uh, arrangement of, uh, songs, uh, either uh, African church songs or uh, traditional uh, songs uh, for for the band, you know, and um, and that was all part of a, a sort of a music theory class, as opposed to really composing. So in my head, uh, I don't think I acknowledged and. Uh, realize and recognize that I was already composing uh, at that at that time you know I think I was really uh, I really realized that I was composing and I wanted to study composition in my second year of university when I was uh, spending more hours or three hours really trying to write music for uh, a brass band you know so that's, that was when I realized that actually I really want to do this. Okay. Composition as a voice within a society. Mm -hmm. Tell us about that. It seems that for you, you have voice, telling a story, a perspective, these things matter. Tell us about that. Um, I always viewed uh, music as, a, as an art which provoke uh, a, a reaction, uh, but also in itself, it's a reaction to uh, uh, the society itself. So what, what we 
we do uh, is always in relation to where we are. And, and that's why I think actually um, I strongly believe that people, when they live at different parts of the world, uh, their way of expression, even if they are African, slightly changes. Uh, because it reacts to uh, the environment in, in where they are. So I, I, I view this and uh, the piece that I wrote um, a few years ago uh, called Cry Out uh, was speaking to, directly to, to, to these issues of how uh, an individual uh, aims to uh, create their own voice, and yet at the same time, they're actually always uh, uh, not limited, but uh, sort of contained by their wish to fit in within the society in where they are. So they, the society, while they try to create who they are, their individual voice, uh, they, there's a part of them which uh, uh, seeks to uh, um, keep in with the norms of the society. So that, that sort of tension uh, was quite interesting in, uh, in, in creating music for me. So I've written a, a number of pieces which engage with, with, such, with such issues uh, uh, of individuality within a society and how that actually kind of like influenced the uh, uh, final result of who they are. And I think that the, the uh, uh, music that I write today um, is a, a combination and a result of the different influences that I have had throughout my whole life so far, which of course include the uh, minimum of three continents, you know. And, and all that I think comes through uh, in my music. So uh, a lot of people, when they listen to my music, uh, often I'm uh, confronted uh, by, the, uh, by the comment, oh, your music is not African, you know, oh. or your music doesn't sound African, you know. And of course, I'm like, I also uh, pose the question, uh, how does African music sound like, you know? You, you uh, maybe <laughs> Sorry? You've taken one of my questions. <laughs> Oh, was a simple, clear question, what is African music? But anyway, go on. <laughs> um, I, I think that uh, uh, there are different stages of composition that we've gone through in, in Africa. Uh, there are those stages where we had uh, sort of the, the outside coming in to study with our masters and then uh, use that uh, to inspire their own new propositions. And then we have a generation of uh, uh, a lot of ethnomusicologists who went out uh, to often to uh, the um, rural areas uh, to study the so-called untouched uh, African music, you know or uninfluenced African music. And then, of course, uh, uh, results of that were uh, music for Western instruments that were almost a duplication of uh, the traditional African music, you know? Uh, and that comes with a lot of political problems that uh, are embedded in, in that uh, as well. And then we have... Um, uh, African composers who were really composers who were went overseas and then came back, uh, realized overseas that maybe actually they don't necessarily stand out. <laughs> so they came back to study, uh, to restudy their African uh, roots in order to rewrite uh, uh, African music, I mean, or inspired African music. I mean, you can uh, name many. Uh, Kevin Wallens is one of the examples out of that generation. But there is also another younger generation uh, which acknowledges that uh, an African today 
is an individual that is, uh, consists of many influences, particularly an urban residing African. I mean, uh, right now, uh, perhaps I am wearing a, 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 an African-inspired T-shirt, and I'm wearing a jean, you know. Uh, um, it's in itself, it's a combination of uh, two worlds, you know. Uh, I'm speaking about African in English, which is a foreign language to, to me. Um, and then a number of people who find themselves uh, at work having to use a foreign language in order to fit in within the environment, they go home, they use their ethnic language in order to uh, fit in within that environment, and they go to traditional meetings, they have to change to uh, traditional attire that fit into that uh, environment. And we do that absolutely seamlessly. You know, it's, it doesn't even actually um, register to us that we actually do that. And, and so I always ask the question, why is it that when it comes to music, we don't acknowledge that kind of behavior? We, we want, a, a, when we define what is called African music, to be something that represents what our forefathers used to do. And, and yet, actually, the, 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 the time that we're living in are no longer actually what our forefathers were living in. So um, the kind of music we're producing speaks to also to where we are today. And so my music is um, uh, influenced by, by many aspects. Um, and I, I guess that's why I started by establishing the connection between spectralism and the, uh, the whole music of the Amatosa people and the uh, uh, Zulu people. Okay, it's quite a lot to, uh, to um, go into there, but we'll talk about spectralism later. Uh, hmm. It's quite a weighty, I mean, the things you just said now are quite weighty. Are we getting hmm. to a point now, and I don't, the people who talk about African music, okay, I think they are, as you said, they are referring to what was old, what was original, what, what went in the past, what existed, okay, as music in the past. Um, I don't necessarily think that they are against what we are seeing today or a mix, a mixing of cultures, so European or Western or Asian and things like that, Eastern cultures with African culture. Perhaps they are trying to reach out into the past and, and make a collection, record what they might refer to as, as real, clean, clear African music. I don't know if they are so anti, but if we quickly skip through to a, a topic about, I wanted to talk to you about transcribing African sounds. This is something that you are involved in um, heavily and quite interested in. And then there is the I Am project. You want to talk about that. And what are you transcribing then if it is a mixture of sounds? How far into the past do you think this, these projects should go? Yeah. So I, I, I think maybe actually I should uh, come back to the point that you, you, you made about uh, the uh, uh, sort of the different kinds of composers that I have mentioned earlier. Um, what I mentioned is not necessarily a, a critique as such, uh, but um, an observation uh, also which defines what I uh, think uh, composition to me, uh, simply meaning that actually it's creating it's creating something new, right? Uh, and that something new that we create could be a combination of the different already existing sound, but there is a difference between a, a composition and simulation. And I, I think actually like uh, transcription, that's where actually comes in. You know, we, we use transcription to understand the, uh, um, uh, the structures that define our, the music of our forefathers and how it used to be. And we use simulation to learn and, and internalize uh, those techniques. 
but we're not yet actually composing because we're actually assimilating what we, our forefathers actually did. Uh, there's a space maybe uh, for, for that. Uh, that's not actually a space really interested as a composer. I'm interested in how do we define music today that in 50 years' time, just like uh, we defined uh, music before colonial, uh, there was a specific music that was uh, created which defined the life then, right? Uh, and how are people going to define the music that defines contemporary composers today in 50 years' time? That's what I'm actually really in interested in, uh, to, in uh, when, when I talk about composition. So the um, uh, I Am Project is an interesting project that I was involved in, and, uh, and I'm very grateful for what it has uh, come out to be. But I don't want to actually really talk about the I Am Project because that's not really my project. Uh, that's the uh, project for another organization. I would like to talk about the project that I am involved in, that I am creating currently, which is the uh, creation of uh, African music uh, online, uh, so our online African music library. Okay, uh, what we aiming to do with this, uh, with the Jew uh, publishers, is to create a space where we uh, transcribe uh, African music, irrespective of the genre, irrespective of the uh, style, uh, and so on, uh, to present and preserve. What is there currently, right? Uh, so it could be pop music, it could be children music, it could be wedding songs, it could be anything. Uh, but we also do more than this uh, to say that um, to preserve is not only just to transcribe and leave it there, right? Uh, music has to be alive, it has to be lived. So how do we speak to the younger generation in order for them to start engaging with uh, this kind of music. I'll make an example. We have, uh, uh, I spoke of the bow instruments. Uh, we have Ugubu, Umakweyan, uh, which is one string bow instrument. Um, that is currently almost in danger of dying out because uh, there are so few people who can perform this instrument and who also can masterfully perform the instrument. Um, if we think about it, uh, and the fact that the support of live performances is slowly dying out, it's very much imaginable that um, in 20 to 30 years' time, there will be no one who actually really plays this instrument. And that is part of our culture which actually dies out. You know, uh, How, in other words, uh, in what other way can we preserve this culture of this music. We can preserve it by actually encouraging more youth to perform this instrument, but we can also preserve it in uh, trying to transcribe and rearrange music of this instrument for other instruments as well that speak to the youth in order for them to already start to engage with this music at a younger age. Uh, with the hope that uh, at a, when they grow up, um, they will have more interest in uh, uh, studying the instrument itself and, and going beyond. So the, this is the, uh, the project that we, we currently are doing uh, with the Jewel Publishers. And we hope that in the next year uh, or two, we'll be able to uh, uh, go live and people can be able to access the uh, archive wherever they are and it's free of charge brilliant well done we look forward to that <laughs> well done and yes. um feel free to let us know how we can work closely with you on any project or anything you are looking at um doing that you think this african composers platform can get involved in um so well done you know recording our history correctly that's brilliant do you think that, uh, just a quick question that occurred to me when you were talking about preserving, what are the best ways to preserve? You've given some examples on what you are actually doing. But do you, where do you think exporting fits into this? So trying to make 
music from the bow, for example, something that is taught globally? Do you think that helps to keep the tradition going to other parts of the world? Anymore? So there is a, uh, you're absolutely right, there's a political uh, angle to this, which of course, uh, the moment I uh, try uh, bow music, for another instrument, I uh, there's uh, there's something about the, the culture and the um, uh, aesthetic of the, the music and the instrument that is taken away. Uh, but uh, also, one has to uh, say that uh, this similar arguments could be made about uh, having um, uh, that music performed in spaces such as. A concert hall where the environment is totally different than where the the the, the music is is usually practiced, you know, as a as a communal space, you know. Um, so there is there is that part, and then one has to actually kind of like uh, evaluate in a similar way as uh, uh, people did. I mean, like I think um, many years ago. Uh, I think uh, mid '90s or maybe a, a slightly earlier, there were a, a huge arguments in Europe about uh, baroque uh, instruments and historical uh, informed performance. You know, uh, uh, you whether performing uh, Mozart, uh, we have to use the uh, original uh, instruments that were. Uh, used in the time of Mozart, or is it appropriate to use a uh, modern cello and modern violin and modern uh, trumpets? You know, uh, which of course has advantage. And the advantage of the modern instrument is that they can stay in tune uh, for the duration of the whole forty-minute symphony, uh, which is not the case with the historical instruments, uh, and so. A number of people went in both ways, but actually the truth is today we still felt that we continue to perform Mozart with modern instrument and we feel that it's good enough to preserve the music, uh, uh, musical heritage uh, that is associated with Mozart, but also with classical period. And I don't think that actually that is hugely different than what I am proposing with our own context in, in, in Africa. It doesn't mean that we have come to completely replace and ignore the uh, original instruments, but alongside that initiative, we can also try to make sure that the music is easily accessible to a broader uh, uh, audience and the broader people are actually performing this music. Okay, so it's multifaceted, definitely. Like produce more bows, teach more people to play the instrument, make sure it's accessible to younger generations, transcribe, record, store, teach in different parts of the world. It's quite a, it's quite a lot to do, but okay. Um, but, I mean, interesting conversation, interesting learning from you so far, but there is something I want to talk about. I don't want to keep these conversations in, um, in the now. I don't want to couch them in today because this, this conversation, as with all the other interviews, are for history and historical purposes. But let's just look at one subject of today that I think you might have something to, you know, have an opinion on, an angle on. You talked about what you are wearing. You talked about how we as Africans, when we move from one maybe area or space or event to the next, we adjust the language we speak, the things we wear. And some of these things are not necessarily African in nature, so to speak, historically. There's a very funny subject that I've noticed in certain Western countries, some Western countries, around the, the thing about copying people's culture. And there's usually a reaction from some people where they say, don't copy my culture. Um, I think they call it appropriation or something. And I listened to you and I said, if some people can hear you speak, they'll realize that as far as Africans are concerned, what are you talking about? You know, We, we yeah. do what we like, as long as you know it, it helps us to achieve what we want. I grew up... Sure doing things like that, you know, we dress however we want, we make any mm. hairstyle we want, we dance the way we mm. want, we imitate accents, we, we do whatever we like. But I've noticed in the West, there seems to, there seems to be a growing problem, which I cannot, I, mm. I, I don't understand. What do you want to do, put people into boxes? 
can you address this subject? <laughs> I don't know if I can address uh, this subject subject very well, but I, you know, I was uh, uh, speaking to uh, a student of mine, uh, uh, Chidi Obijiago, and he did uh, research in uh, uh, Igbo choral music. And during this research, we, we looked at how uh, this, this work sort of represent the history, but also at the same time, it still speaks to the current uh, um, environment. And uh, we looked at, at, looked at, at different uh, angles, but we also looked at the language, you know. And uh, I think West Africa, for example, is one of a very good uh, point. And I have to mention that the situation in West Africa is slightly different from the East, it's slightly different from the North, and is uh, perhaps uh, different from the South too. But I, I found it quite interesting, the development of uh, uh, Pigeon language, which uh, uh, at one point it was defined as an inferior uh, way of expressing and expression uh, by uh, the Europeans, but also that in itself was uh, communicated quite clearly to the Africans themselves to discriminate against each other uh, with those who are speaking pidgin language, you know. And, um, and then there were uh, characters such as Fela Kuti, who was highly educated and yet actually consciously took the decision to use pidgin language as his form of expression. I think that actually says a lot in terms of how we uh, define what we do and understand that what we do has always a political angle. And if we fail to understand that, actually we, we, we are lost uh, in a way. Right? So uh, there are certain things which I can do uh, and understand and get away with in Africa. There are certain things which I can I see things that I have to understand that in doing those things in Europe or in America has a different political angle. And if I don't understand that, actually, I, I get to all sorts of kind of, of troubles, uh, such as the one you actually uh, 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 mentioning right now, because this uh, ex exploitation, uh, and this is maybe similar to what I was explaining er earlier about the problem of um, creating music by taking basically traditional music and assimilating it for a Western instrument. Uh, that is another form of exploitation. And that exploitation, actually, to be quite honestly, is, is, is not related to who you are, whether you are uh, 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 African or Western. It's ex it is an exploitation itself. And there is also another uh, sort of political uh, angle to that, which is why are you doing that? Are you doing that because the Western instrument is better than the African instrument? Is it like, are you improving what you actually, uh, your source? And the, the answer is actually not true. The music, where you're taking it from, is already perfect as it is in the instrument that actually it's being performed in. So the, there is always that sort of political angle that I think one has to be quite carefully in dealing with the uh, uh, the so-called archive and the uh, uh, idea of simulating as a way of composing, you know. And, and that's why I was trying to define the definition between these two, you know. Uh, if I'm trying to preserve, it's a different story. I'm not actually taking the uh, credit of saying I created this, which is not true, okay. right? right? But I'm actually kind of like acknowledging that this is a, a presentation that was taken and represent the, the creator who the creator was that person, right? Mm -hmm. So it, it acknowledges 
the, the original source and the, the original people who really created the work, you know, as artists and equally, there was the same way that I would like my name to be acknowledged in all of my compositions. Okay, thanks for tying the conversation back to music. That's really important. So yes, it's um it's about copying or imitating, but acknowledging the original source. The only yeah. problem around the the thing about dress, I think they usually complain about the way people dress and hairstyles, is you can't put on a hairstyle and run around with a placard screaming, I copied this from India, I copied this from China, I copied this from... So I think a, a little bit of um, leeway has to be given, but yes, around music, absolutely, it has to be acknowledged. We copied this music 50 years ago from this town in Tanzania. You know, we copied this from South Africa, from West Africa, East. That That's absolutely right, yes. When you imitate, you transcribe, you copy, the acknowledgement has to be there in writing, preferably, and online as much as possible. Okay, let's talk about spectralism and what you do in spectralism. Before I do that, I want to just quickly read out um, the title of somebody's um, master's thesis. Our guest composer of today, I want you to look up his profile, okay? He's, um, he's a composer whose works have been performed in different parts of the world, different countries. He's composed quite a few works. Um, he's very well known in South Africa, very well known in different parts of the world. And he even has his name mentioned in the title of somebody's master's degree thesis, which is quite something. So I'll just read out the title of the thesis and then we talk about spectralism. So uh, the title is A South African Spectral Composer and Dile Kumalo. Fantastic. Not many people are going to have their names as part of, you know, master's thesis or PhD um, works. So let's talk about spectralism. It's something that you that's quite close to you. It's something you work on. Can you tell us a bit about it and and what you do in this area? So the 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 way I understand um, this is that we we deal with sound uh, on a daily basis, and uh, in order to understand some of the intricacies uh, and the complexities that is associated with, uh, in this particular case, I'm very specific about the Amakosa people, is the, the, uh, um, how they deal with the uh, acoustics or the scientific uh, structure of a sound as the foundation of the composition. And, and this they do it naturally by voice, but. Um, the use of computers today to uh, sort of go deeper to the sound and understand the the core uh, and the foundation of each sound as a sound first before we actually even talk about the instrument or talk about the voice or talk about the style uh, for me was was critical in uh, trying to create something new uh, so the uh, uh, spiritualism in essence, is dealing with the acoustics, you know, understanding the sound, uh, uh, um, well, in, in its purest form. And it could be any sound. Uh, there are compositions that are, are based on the sound of a sound wave, you know. Uh, and for people who actually live close to, uh, to the sea, um, the, the sound of a sound wave um, is or uh, waves crashing against the uh, the uh, the rocks and so on has a specific meaning that sometimes we, we don't find to express uh, in the traditional uh, realm of let's say tonal music you know it doesn't actually it's not possible right so there's a way in which the certain structures, even in even 12 tone and other forms of uh, compositional techniques that we had before, has some kind of limitations in terms of really expressing this. Now, if I, if you analyze the music of Amakosa people, you know, they were so advanced uh, before the technology was there. They already in their music try to imitate the sounds that they hear uh, next to next to them, right? I mean, like, there's a, a, a paper that I published uh, uh, two years ago where we analyzed how the Eastern music sort of really uh, organically analyzed the sound of a car 
and reproduce that using the voice as well as the structure of the instrument, both in terms of composition, but it also in terms of sound. Now, these are uh, uh, areas and aspects of uh, so-called African music, which we don't get to hear and understand uh, in everything that has been discussed so far about African music. If you go to music from Uganda too, it deals a lot with uh, uh, timbre as the foundation of the make head of the pitch and the rhythms, you know. Um, that doesn't mean that all African music are like that. But what I'm saying is that actually kind of like for me, this was one aspect which is often ignored uh, when speaking about African music, that actually we use timbre as the foundation. Uh, the other aspect to, to this, uh, um, I don't know if uh, a lot of people understand, but we have uh, practitioners uh, like Shaman, you know, who are people who are able to communicate with uh, the ancestors and the people who have passed on, you know, um, whenever they get to that spiritual space, actually they are, the timbre of their voice changes, right? And it's a, an unconscious uh, experience from their side that if you ask them, they will not even be able to tell you how they sounded like, you know? So that tells you actually that we timbre plays an important uh, aspect uh, to our life. Uh, if you uh, look at equal language, uh, the Zulu language, uh, and even the Tosa language, the intonation, the change of timbre in the uh, uh, language itself already changes the meaning of that particular word, even though the, 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 the word is written exactly the same way and uh, uh, spelled out uh, the same way, but the pronunciation of that word changes the meaning. That means actually in language, in our life, the timbre is a critical part of, uh, of our lives. And of course, we all know that music uh, at least in many African cultures, forms the foundation of everyday life experiences, you know. So it's it, it, uh, uh, not possible to imagine that they will div uh, separate the way they think of the music from the way their life, uh, language, expression uh, uh, is experienced uh, in the African culture. So, so that in itself for me was uh, one of the reasons why I was really quite interested uh, in the concepts of spiritualism. Uh, and of course it provided me uh, in shaping the sound as I wanted. And of course earlier on we, I, I talked about how the I deal with images uh, with different colors and so on, you know. So that for me was uh, one other area in which it connected with who I am and how I can express myself in this mm, It sounds like a whole, well, I won't call it new. You've been working on this for, you know, a few years, you know, but it sounds like a different area. I don't think I've ever heard anybody talk about this before. Maybe it's one that more and more African composers, African musicians, probably want to explore or should consider um, exploring and looking into. Can we talk about the Ensemble Modern Conference very quickly? Um, you've, you are meant to take part in that. Let's talk about the subject of the conference. Um, I've been invited to be part of uh, a conference called uh, Afrofuturism. And the uh, I think they, this has been going on for, for, a, for a while now. And uh, I guess the simplest way to, to define is uh, basically how do we imagine today or the future of Africa to be uh, the way we see it today? So, and I think this is quite interesting. Again, it speaks to uh, what I've been uh, saying throughout, and, and that is the definition of composition is a, a practice that looks ahead, but in the now, 
right? Uh, with, of course, consideration of where we come from, you know. Um, so the the piece that I I compose uh, for them uh, really uses aspects of uh, um, uh, spiritualism as the as the foundation. Um, and uh, of course, uh, the way I always compose is I, I analyze a particular sound, and then from that particular sound, develop a, a sort of a, a composition from this. Um, and in this case, I had actually analyzed um, a sound or a sort of uh, instrument uh, of the Tosa people called Mkhube which uh, many people uh, define as a, a mouth bow uh, instrument. So you use your, your mouth cavity to shape the uh, resonances and the frequencies and overtones uh, of, uh, the, um, uh, of the sound itself. You know? In that way, you are able to change the color of the, of the instrument, but you're also able to produce the uh, different melodies, you know, uh, which is quite difficult to do and quite interesting uh, the way you uh, analyze that. But also at the same time, you know, uh, that sound is very close to uh, a steam train sound. Right? And if we look at the tradition of the train, uh, within our context, you know, like uh, that pe many people have written about the concept of a train. Uh, one of them is uh, Huma Sigela, a famous jazz musician in South Africa who just passed away a few years ago. Uh, where that is that uh, form of transportation uh, defined uh, a lot about our not culture, but uh, the situation, so social situation, you know, like uh, people left their families to go and seek work in towns. Sometimes uh, they left uh, their own country to seek work, you know, and they would leave for many years, not come back, you know, um, because they had to actually make money, you know. So the, the sound of the steam train uh, for many, has a very kind of like mixed nostalgic uh, experiences. You know, we don't have this anymore, um, but and we have other forms that create the, the similar senses of uh, sort of mixed feelings. Uh, so this this idea of Afrofuturism uh, sort of presented for me a, a similar kind of experience and feeling of imagining uh, uh, an Africa that is completely independent and completely sort of uh, um, self-assured of who they are and what they do and irrespective of like uh, what's happening around the world you know like I mean like I don't want to get to the politics because there, there, there's a huge area about that but it's uh, it's not a, a secret that we still are strongly dependent uh, to our colonial powers even today, even though some of us actually received or got our independence 60 or 70 years ago, right? Uh, our economies are still dependent uh, on those uh, 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 former colonial powers. And that defines many things that we do uh, for us, even though you claim that we do what we want, uh, one could question how far that is actually true. You know, like uh, you, you talked earlier on about uh, the hair. Uh, I mean, in South Africa, that uh, has been for a few years now another huge uh, sort of area of uh, consultation. You know. Uh, People uh, talking about, I'm mean, like bringing up valid points about acknowledging and uh, uh, cherishing and also being proud of your who you are as defined by him, right? Uh, 
I don't want to really uh, sort of really uh, go deeper to that because, as you said, you know, like I, <laughs> I am bold. I I am a man. I don't actually really understand fully. It doesn't even matter. Please give us your opinion. Sorry? Don't worry. I said, just give give us your opinion. It doesn't invalidate your opinion. <laughs> it's just be your opinion. Oh, yes, yes. Um, like, my opinion is is very simple. Is is, is that both sides are, are I think are important. Uh, what is important is is that you feel beautiful in who you are and how you want to look like. You know, and uh, and it's a uh, um, uh, taken away from the, the baggage that comes with our histories, you know? And, and that's what actually I, I, I want to, to, to express, that I think actually that's uh, defining the future of Africa. I, I, would like, uh, I would like to see our grandchildren growing up in a world that is uh, good to them and that is fair to them and that defines and cherish who they are then and now, right? Uh, as opposed to uh, trying to assimilate others in order to validate uh, your... Sorry, trying to simulate others in order to validate your word. We didn't catch the last word. In order to validate your existence. Your existence, okay, all right. Uh, Thank you very much for that deep dive into what's going to happen at the conference. And we look forward to hearing the output, you know, your your uh, composition for the conference. This might sound like a very odd question. In fact, thinking about it, it feels very odd. <laughs> but I, I think I should just ask. It's Afro Afrofuturism. It's taking place in Stuttgart, I believe. But that's not what's relevant here. I mean, that's a, a whole different conversation. The actual question here is, we're talking about Afrofuturism. Do you know how many African composers are going to be part of that event? Now, I say it's an odd question because, of course, an answer might be, why do we have to have African composers just because it says Afrofuturism? We are global, aren't we? So here goes. All right. <laughs> Let's talk about that. Yeah. So I, I think, actually, it's, it's important to also acknowledge that when we say Africa, we wish we include also African diaspora. You know, um, they are and our forefathers were taken from this continent to different parts of the world, and uh, wherever they are, uh, uh, to a certain extent, they still continued our tradition and continue to want to be part of their ancestors. Right. So um, I, don't, um, I don't want to push back on that at all, but um. The second part, when you said they want to be, I, I don't know if we can speak generally about people, but I think when you say yes, when we talk right. about Africa, we should remember African diaspora. That again, there's a whole different subject around what is the definition of African diaspora. Um, but let's remember for me, when we talk about Africa, I don't want to remember African diaspora and forget Africa. Africa is a standalone continent. This part is the reason right. why this platform exists, basically. It's, we must acknowledge Africa as a continent, not as a subgroup yeah. of somebody else. So I just wanted to, I don't want to stop your... I, stop I, I agree your, with you. I, I agree with you and I take your point uh, um, uh, very well. And I would like to actually come back to this. Uh, the reason why I'm saying this is because uh, I think that uh, our solutions in how we define the future for us uh, should not only be limited to the people living in the continent as the only people who can define that. Because as I mentioned earlier, uh, and there are a number of African people who still even today leave the continent and go to Europe and America for better uh, uh, opportunities, right? It doesn't change them to be... Uh, less Africans, right? But they are actually defined as African diaspora, right? And of course, I mean, I don't want to, to uh, go into the definition uh, and all the uh, sort of angles that define what yeah. African diaspora yeah. is. You know? <laughs> but what I'm, what I'm just saying that uh, is just because in this conference, uh, I happen to be the only African who is currently living 
in Africa does not necessarily mean that actually uh, we don't have African voices. In fact, the whole concept consists of only Africans and African diaspora. Okay, so what I think what so, I meant was not who is living in Africa, I just meant African composers full stop rather than who is living in. Um, I'm an African, I'm not currently sitting in Africa, but I'm still an African, doesn't change anything. So I, I kind of meant yeah. who are the representatives or who is going to be at the yeah. Yes, I think also your question is uh, pointing towards something else as well, which I think I sort of hinted towards, and, and that is the true evidence, right? Uh, of the African and African countries and African people themselves, you know. Sorry, I didn't. I didn't and, catch and that. The true dependence to the that. True. So the, the, the liberation. So uh, liberating ourselves uh, also means that we have to, uh, both in terms of uh, um, producing, but also in terms of support, financial support we have to support our heritage. And, and, and I think that your part of the question is really uh, pointing towards that, that we need, still need um, uh, strong support from our governments of our heritage and of our cultural activities, right? So it's not right that uh, we have to wait for uh, Europe or America to organize and fund such uh, conversations about the future of Africa when we have the possibility to do so. So yes, you are right, there are not that many sort of uh, uh, conferences happening in Africa, particularly to, uh, when it comes to music. One has also have to be careful because that, that co those conversations are happening in other fields, you know, when it comes to literature, uh, when it comes even to visual arts, you know. But it's it's uh, interesting that when it comes to music, those conversations are really happening, you know, and they're really supported too, you know. So so it, on the one side you are right. Um, on the one side, I would also say that the uh, such initiatives are much appreciated because they allow the exposure of such uh, uh, conversations, you know? I will, not um, push, I will not push back at all. That's why at the beginning of the question, I mentioned where the conference is taking place, but I said we'll set that aside because it yeah. is he who pays the piper, you know, that determines the tune. So if somebody in a different mm. country, different continent decides, I want to explore this subject, but let's have the conversation in my country, even though it's talking about Africa. What are you going mm. to do? You didn't pay for the film. Why are you trying to dictate who should act in the film? You know, so let's face reality. Mm. As you talk about finances, this really matters. It, it comes up time and again when people complain about African films or stories about Africa and foreign actors being asked to play the major roles or the main parts. You get all these complaints. Mm. But then you have to remember, somebody is paying for the film. If you pay for the film, you can yeah. dictate who should play different parts. It's, it's actually that straightforward. Um, but yeah. yes. Thanks for you know mentioning that part. Absolutely, we are not pushing back against those who are trying to support, promote, explore. One thing that I will say though is and this is completely unrelated to music. When I see events where people say, "Oh, let's go to London. We are going to discuss the twenty solutions to Africa's agricultural problems," well, that's simplifying it. The way the, type, the events are titled, it basically discusses solving Africa's problem in this area. It's happening in London. You think, wait a minute, yeah. why are you trying to solve my problem in London or solve my problem in Germany? Yeah. Why, why don't you go and solve the problem somewhere in South Africa? You know, pick a place, pay for the flights, yeah. the hotel, the food, yeah. improve the economy there. But anyway, thank goodness, more and more people are discovering that they can have these meetings online. So there's no need for, you know, the, the whole wrangle of having people travel to different parts of the world to solve Africa's problems, so to speak. Uh, but you but you're right, and I think actually this point needs to be made, and I, I think our leaders need to come uh, 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 more strongly uh, about this, uh, and that is we have uh, the power to shape our future, and we can decide in the way we react today by not supporting, by not nurturing our our culture, that actually, and accept that in the future, this will have consequences, and those consequences might be actually really 
uh, difficult for our uh, grandchildren, you know. And, and so uh, the responsibility, you're absolutely right, has to be shouldered by uh, Africans themselves. You know, we have to define where do we want to, to go and where do you want to be uh, uh, in the future. I also want to actually say that, I, I mean, like the, uh, uh, it's, it's not just the culture, it's uh, uh, the way we interact also as people, you know, like, uh, a, in many countries they're dealing with it, but particularly in South Africa, we have a huge problem of killing of women, you know. And, uh, and, and this is unfortunately, majority of it, uh, our killing own uh, African women, you know. And it's such things where I, I say, like, you know, we, we, we need to take responsibility for it and today you know you have a lot of books that are written about the same thing and very black Africans are actually writing about those very black uh, few uh, um, uh, government authorities are really taking this so seriously and engaging it so you're absolutely right that uh, I would like to see in the future where we change from this culture of dependency and start to take initiatives ourselves of our own future. Okay. Wow. Brilliant. Thank you. So are you still a lecturer at, uh, I think, the University of Witwatersrand? Are you still a lecturer there? That's correct, yes. How is that going? <laughs> Uh, it's going very well. Uh, we uh, uh, got to a new space this year, which I think uh, is both uh, positive but challenging at this point. And that is uh, the online learning. Uh, I say it's positive because I think that uh, creating those, uh, once we get to a point where we actually really uh, have that sort of mastered, uh, it will greatly help our students who come from different backgrounds and to be able to actually uh, have take that time in learning uh, uh, the context and what we teach in class. Uh, because, of course, you know, when, when you're in class, you go uh, sometimes at a faster speed than what others actually really need. You know, the different backgrounds, um, means that some, some are actually also struggling with the language, the English itself, you know, and, and that we take sometimes for granted, you know. Uh, the, uh, some uh, have had no absolutely formal training uh, in music in high school, you know, uh, and that's maybe 80% of all our government schools. And so you can imagine how many people are coming from government schools government school. And if we want to create a, a sense of a, a transformed environment, it means also we have to be catering also for those who are coming in uh, um, social backgrounds that are not uh, the same as uh, private schools, so to say, right? So I think this this environment allows, will allow people to actually kind of like have a somehow an equal chance uh, uh, in different areas of study because they will have a possibility to really look and, and watch and learn uh, through the video as many times as, as possible. Uh, whereas in a class situation, you know, you have one hour and it's gone, it's gone, you know. If you, you didn't manage to take enough notes at that time, you know, you, you're dealing with your memory, and sometimes your, your memory can let you down, and and that actually affects uh, a lot of people. So, uh, the numbers uh, this year have shown that the pass rate. Give me a second, please. Let's give our guest a few seconds. We appear to have lost his sound.
I have sent him a message, asked him to please maybe perhaps reset his connection. Let's see. Just give us a few seconds, please. Thank you. Thanks to those who are watching. Don't forget you can drop comments for our guest composer and you can even leave questions which I can post to him depending on the questions. Thank you very much. So he's trying to reconnect. Thank you. Feel free to drop your questions in the comments section. Thank you. And any comments you have, of course. Hello, welcome back. <laughs> Sorry, I lost me there. No problem. You were talking about the pass rate. Sorry for this year. Welcome back. Thank you for coming back. <laughs> no, I was saying that the, the pass rate shows that the uh, current situation uh, is helpful to many students. Uh, we, we have an improved pass rate compared to the time before COVID 19. All right, so I talked earlier about, I mean, sorry, I know we have gone over time, but this is such an interesting conversation and I want to capture as much as possible from you. Also, it's brilliant, the video is much clearer, so fantastic. So I talked about your music being performed in different parts of the world, in South Africa, Sweden, Switzerland, Germany, the United States and Japan. Uh, so thank you very much for joining us today. I just want to talk about very quickly about you being featured in um, Carnegie Hall's Ubuntu Festival in 2014. Uh, 2014. Sorry? 2013. 2013, I beg your pardon. It's the source of the information, obviously, is not correct. <laughs> so we need to fix yeah. things like this. <laughs> we have the composer himself telling us factually yeah. that it was in 2013. So this source needs to correct the information. Um, uh, well, actually, I, I should also say that uh, my memory says 2013, but it may be actually my. Might be 20, 2014. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now, but, uh, yes. your, your works have been performed in different parts of the world. You've been featured at Carnegie Mellon as well. Um, what for you is the most memorable of all of these performances? Ooh. Hmm. I think I've had actually really good uh, performances, but in 2013, I was also involved in um, French uh, South Africa cultural exchange uh, um, uh, festival, which is the autumn uh, festival. Uh, every year they try to feature a different country and in 2013 they featured South Africa. And uh, two of my pieces were performed uh, there. Uh, I had really a, a wonderful experience uh, working with, with those uh, musicians and having the whole environment, actually having the, the, the pieces performed, which was absolutely uh, a brilliant performance. You know, uh, I think we only had two uh, performances, uh, sorry, two rehearsals, and then we had uh, a performance, and 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 to be able to actually write music in such a way that you almost don't have to explain yourself, and the musician can actually just you know take it and you know it's um, and it's perfect. And I think I don't know if you've seen some of my scores. Uh, they're not that easy to perform, I have to be honest. Uh, and so this was a, a, a pleasure to, to see. But also I've worked a few years ago with uh, um, uh, 
Irish clarinetist. Uh, her name is Carol McGonnell, and uh, she performed one of my clarinet pieces in uh, Ireland. Uh, and that was one of the most beautiful experience to uh, not only the way she performed, but the way she was so invested in the work that uh, sometimes she would actually kind of like even um, for the acoustics to be appropriate for the performance of the piece, you know. Sorry, so we didn't, we didn't catch that. Sorry. I didn't catch that. You said sometimes she will do what? So the, I mean, a, a number of people will just put a score and perform the work, you know. Yes. Uh, but for her, she realized how the acoustics and sometimes different rooms affect the overall sound of the of the um, of the piece. And I mentioned earlier how the. Uh, sound as the foundation of the composition is a critical component of my uh, music, meaning that uh, it's not only just the score and the, the notes on the paper, but also the uh, uh, cognizance uh, of the importance of the acoustics and how that in itself influence the uh, uh, resulting sound of, of the piece. You know? So to for her to be able to actually kind of like be that invested and be able to try and find a different sort of like a soft and sweet spot of the room in order to perform just this particular piece was absolutely amazing you know okay, um, okay yeah. i just have two more questions before we round up thank you so much you for sitting and going over the time i really appreciate this um just two more questions if you don't mind what is the composition of yours that you are most proud of? Oof, uh, I think, uh, I don't know if you as a composer are able to, to answer that question, uh, but to be quite honest, I, I'm not able to, to answer that question because I always feel that uh, in each and every piece that I write, uh, I leave part of my soul there you know there's there's uh, uh, some of the pieces uh, takes months uh, and y a year to actually complete and and that's not a, a time specific in terms of the duration of the piece you know but in terms of the engagement and some are so intense that you you just cannot compose uh, the whole week but actually you need to to compose two days and have a a day of recovery and then go on, you know, so it takes it takes longer. Um, and some of the pieces are like when they come alive, you know, you get almost a different life to it, you know, it's like the, the different performers bring different interpretation and different uh, expression. And I think that uh, some of the performances sometimes have made me to feel like, oh, maybe this was not such a good piece, you know? And then I hear uh, a few years later, the same piece performed by a different musician. I said, wow, actually this is amazing, you know? So it's, uh, I would, I would be reluctant to actually say there's one particular piece that <laughs> sort of really uh, is at the top for me. Uh, uh, I mean, the, uh, I know it sounds very much. Uh, it doesn't sound like okay. anything. Don't worry. I, we completely understand. <laughs> Don't worry. It's a typical answer. Don't worry. Um, okay. So you, you are part of Africa's history, a key part of Africa's history. We are recording and talking to you today. So you are at a point in Africa's history when you, if, if you are asked to describe yourself, remember, remembering that this is a recording for historical purposes, how would you describe yourself? as somebody who is at a point in our history, say we are going to write about Africa and from year to year, decade to decade, and then your name is mentioned somewhere. I know it's quite difficult. I'm not asking you to self-praise. I'm sure you feel uncomfortable. She wants me to praise myself. No, but how would you place yourself in history um, today? I think I'm, I'm still at the very beginning of, of history. And 
Uh, it's my hope that uh, the work that I do will uh, influence a younger generation and uh, perhaps to a certain extent uh, um, be exemplary to the kind of uh, artwork that defined uh, this time period that we're in today. Uh, so I, 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 that's how I would sort of situate myself uh, in, 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 in the history. And, uh, and of course, we uh, acknowledge that the, the history in itself uh, today is going to be here. So it must uh, sort of experience that we create on a daily basis, you know. Uh, but my feeling uh, today where I am, I am so uh, grateful to the many uh, older generation of co African composers that I continue to learn from, and some of them are still alive. And uh, I, I, I have a lot of respect for them and then their wisdom and knowledge. So I, I, I see myself as a student still, still. Wow, brilliant. Thank you very much for this interview. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you for everything that we have learned about you today, your input, your suggestions, your advice, even without realizing it. We've learned quite a lot from you today. You gave us suggestions, advice, pieces of nuggets of wisdom. Um, thank you so much. And thanks for your patience and for just seamlessly going over, you know, with me <laughs> over the planned uh, one hour uh, duration of the interview. I really appreciate it. Thank you to those who are still watching us live. It's been brilliant. I hope you had a an interesting time as much as I did talking to our guest composer of today. So we wish you success with your future endeavors. Please, as I said earlier in the interview, feel free to keep in touch. Let us know if you want to collaborate with us in any way. It's just a, a simple platform, website, a Facebook page, a YouTube page, and different other aspects that I've um, tried to talk about African composers online, different other areas on the internet. So feel free to just reach out. But thank you again, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much, Adewe. And uh, I'm so grateful for this opportunity. You have no idea. You've uh, made me a very happy person today. And thank you for your wonderful questions. And I'm hopeful that someone will learn something from this. And yeah, thank you, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your day. Bye-bye. You have a lovely one, bye-bye.